Good afternoon. Happy Friday. I'm Kawi Lucas. This is Think Tech Hawaii. Hawaii is my mainland. And with me today is Anthony Alto, who wears many hats in this town. Um, today he's here as the co-producer of No Room in Paradise, which is a 90-minute documentary of uh, our homeless issues here in Honolulu. Um, I've only seen it twice. Um, I'm looking wow. forward to seeing it again. Um, do you have, I, I listened to your pod um, cast with Chad Blair and you mentioned that the trailer had had over a million views. Mm -hmm. Wow. 1.1 million at this point, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, but surprisingly, or maybe not, um, I was surprised that um, the majority of them were from the continent and not in Hawaii. What well, else do you know? Well, I, not very much. I mean, <laughs> when you, people go in to see your trailer, it's not as if they're typing in where they live or, or, or why they're watching it from the mainland. But I think it does point to the fact that we have quite a large diaspora of people who were born and raised in Hawaii who now live on the mainland, who still have an interest in things to do with Hawaii. Plus, Hawaii is a place that holds a lot of interest for a lot of people uh, who maybe have never even been here. But when it comes to the diaspora, the fact that you have so many people on the mainland, in fact, a lot of the comments of people who saw the trailer were, you know, I was born and raised in Hawaii, I'd love to move back, but I can't, the cost of housing. And of course, if you're going to be talking about homelessness, then one of the issues you're going to be talking about is the cost of housing. So in a way, I wasn't surprised that there were so many people on the mainland who were, who, who were watching the trailer. Any idea what the viewership was like? It was broadcast several, several times on three different channels, I think. I'd Two channels, yeah, Two KGMB, channels. KHNL, the Hawaii News Now channels. Um, I have no way of knowing how okay. many people. I, anecdotally, you know, a lot of people are coming up to me. I went to, when I went to vote, the, the lady looked up, she said, oh, you're the guy who, who made that film in the documentary, um, which, was, which was good because we want people to be watching this. We want attention. This was not um, supposed to be just a sort of documenting the problem, fly on the wall, take a look at this, isn't this problem ghastly kind of thing. It was, it, it, we definitely had an activist approach. We had a campaigning desire behind it, which was to change the attitude of the public at large. And the way we wanted to do that was first and foremost to get them to see the homeless as human beings, to understand what they're like. Um, my feeling is, it's not that people instinctively have an antipathy towards the homeless. They just don't know them. They don't talk to them. I think what they see typically is what goes around the homeless. They see their tents, their shanties, often a lot of garbage. So they, they see that garbage and they sort of think, well, maybe the people, somebody who can live like that must be human garbage. And of course, that's not the case. And what I, you know, I had my own biases going in. One of the things I was surprised about was just how intelligent and articulate a lot of these people are um, and how open they are to admitting that they've made mistakes. I mean, some of them will I say. I was shocked. I was really shocked. I thought, wow, I, that's, uh, I think that's a testament to the way you went about filming it, too. I mean, I, I heard it was 18 months. Yeah. That's, that's a long time. You were able to build relationships with these people. But still, to get that amount of just real, just bearing their souls was amazing. I, it didn't take much effort. I mean, Sure, we showed up and we sat down and we treated them like human beings as equals. We talked to them. How did you find the people that you spoke with? Did you, did you start with, is his name Joshua? Justin, Justin, Justin. Phillips, the nar narrator. Yeah, we did. Well, the, what happened was um, Rick Blangiardi from Hawaii News Now, who's a hero in the sense that he is determined to make our community face up to this problem and do something about it. He came to us. Uh, and asked us to make a documentary. And I think he did it because he understood that he's been running a lot of news clips about the homeless. And I think he realized that he had done a good job in raising awareness about the problem, but that didn't mean that he had necessarily done anything about helping us move to the next step to start doing what we need to do to, to address the problem. If anything, I think he, there was some, there's a feeling out there, I don't know that it's ever been poll tested or anything, but there's a feeling out there that, that people might be getting Fatigued, homeless fatigue. You know, not another, oh, yeah. not another, yeah, yeah. not another news story about the homeless kind of thing, sure. right? So he thought, why don't we do a documentary and look at it more in depth? And we said, yes, of course, we'd love to do it, but we know nothing about the homeless. What are we going to do? So wow. we went to the largest homeless agency in town, which is the Institute for Human Services. We spoke to Connie Mitchell, the executive director there, and we said, Connie, we know nothing. We need an education. Can you help us? And she said, well, 
why don't you go and meet with Justin Phillips, who's our top field outreach guy, and let him introduce you to the streets. And so we followed Justin around for three months. Um, and he introduced us to the homeless. Okay. So and I, I, I just want to repeat what he said right off the bat, then I knew, okay, this is something really great. When he said, we don't have a homeless crisis, right. we have half a dozen. Right. And then he mentioned the mentally ill, he mentioned the Micronesians, he mentioned the addicts, and on and on and on. And I was just like, oh, finally, somebody is not trying to simplify this into meaninglessness. So it's 90 minutes for a good reason. Right. Uh, Rick asked us to do 60 minutes. <laughs> and after six months, we went back to him and we said, it's got to be 90 minutes. Actually, what we asked for, we, we asked for a, a week-long series of half-hour specials. <sighs> and he said, you guys are nuts. Forget about it. <laughs> and then we said, well, how about 90 minutes? And he said, I'll see what I can do. And then, but when he started to see the footage that was coming in and what we were trying to do, he understood. And he said, okay, it's going to cost me an arm and a leg. Because don't forget, he showed all of these uh, documentaries in prime time without any commercials. So Hawaii News now, you know, let go of a fair bit of income that they could have been making in those time slots. So another reason to take, tip one's hat to, to Rick Blangiardi. Uh, and I'll, I'll just mention that at the end of the show, we'll um, have information about how you can order a DVD. Um, um, By making a donation to IHS, let's make that clear. Yes. It's a gift. Wonderful. It's a gift. You can get a DVD or, you, or a video, streaming video on demand if you make a gift. I mean, I shouldn't say you're not allowed to actually predicate it on, but if you make a $15 gift <laughs> donation, we will, we will make a gift. All right. <laughs> okay, so back to the, okay, so 90 minutes is a really naughty problem with um, all different angles to it, and you guys dove in and went around and actually met them where they are. Right. And I think the 90 minutes actually goes by quite, quite fast, precisely yeah. because we look at the different aspects. But, well, there are two for a few reasons. I mean, one is filmmakers. We knew that we had to tell a story. You know, if we just had talking heads there blathering on about their expert yeah. opinion, people would have switched off pretty fast. So we have two homeless families, single mothers with their children, who, who serve as the spine, the thread, if you like, from the start of the film to the end of the film. And we follow each of the stages, and they explain why they become homeless. And when you find out that a woman has been raped at 16 and suffered years of, of domestic abuse, physical abuse, uh, mental abuse, emotional abuse, until the point where she says, enough, and she grabs her five kids and leaves the home, leaves the car. I mean, this was a middle-class woman, leaves everything behind and ends up camped out on Kapahulu. That already is getting people, and, she's, and, and what does she say? I mean, she says, I know what society thinks of us. I know what I used to think of the homeless. I used to, I used to talk, the phrase she uses, I used to talk a lot of crap about the homeless. And now she finds herself in that situation, and she says, you know, we're not what society would think of us. And then she says something that I suspect a lot of people in the audience want to hear, which is, I feel so ashamed. And in fact, the shame isn't hers. The shame is the, on the man who raped her. The shame is on the, the boyfriend who beat her up all of those years. But she's the one who's ended up homeless on the, on the streets by the canal. And she feels that shame, and she wants to get off the canal. Unfortunately, as part of this process of going through what she's gone through in her life, she's also became an addict, right? And so we see her dealing with that. And in the film, yeah. she gives birth to her sixth child, conceived on the banks of the Kapa Kapalama Canal. And it turns out that while she was pregnant, she had been smoking ice. Um, and fortunately, the baby was born without any meth in its system. Um, but so we follow that story from start to finish. And then along the way, we look at some of these other issues. So we look at the, the issue of the mental health. Yeah, let's take a moment on that, because the, the numbers in that were really eye-opening. Um, I commend you for your, the, the people you spoke to were great. I'm looking forward to talking to Alan um, myself um, for a half hour or so, Johnson. Um, he said um, it would save $2 billion a year if we had the appropriate care for the seriously mentally ill, and Colin Kippen put that number at 1,300. He said there are 1,300 uh, of our homeless uh, population who are seriously mentally ill. So. No, not quite. I have to correct you on your number. Okay. In Honolulu, on Oahu, we're talking about roughly 1,350 chronically homeless. 
chronically homeless are people, essentially the shorthand way of saying, they're the people you see on the streets. Because what you have to understand is that, in fact, they're only the tip of the iceberg. The majority of the homeless are not people who live on the streets. The majority of the homeless are people who are couch surfing, they're living out of their car, uh, at worst, they're living in a homeless shelter. They are not on the streets. You have to be chronically homeless to be living on the streets. So two-thirds of them are people that we never see. Typically, they're people who, who've had a, you know, they've lost a job, they've had a medical issue. They may need first month's rent, security, deposit. You, you help them with that, they get housed, and you never see or hear from them again. Uh, but the chronically homeless, are rotating in and out of the system again and again and again and again, and they're living on the streets, and they're the ones who are costing us huge amounts of money. Of those 1,350, I forget exactly the numbers, but maybe a third have severe mental problems. Ah, okay, so fewer. Um, right. In theory, if you look at the point in time count that they do every year, once a year in January, how many of them are, uh, are addicts, I think it's supposed to be something like 20%. That number is wrong. It's wrong because if you go up to somebody and say, are you an addict, they're likely to say no. <laughs> I've actually suggested to them that they should just say to them, when was the last time you used drugs? Because actually, if you ask the homeless, in my experience, you ask them that, they tend to, they tend to give you a, an answer. Um, my experience is probably 75% of the people on the streets are addicted. And of them, maybe half of them became homeless because they were addicts, and half of them became addicts because they were homeless. Um, but whichever way it is, they're costing us a lot of money, and we're spending it in stupid ways. We're spending it on emergency health services. We're spending it on, on ambulance rides. We're not spending it on helping them. It's very difficult to get a detox bed. You know, it can take two weeks. For an addict, an addict says, you know what, I'm fed up with this. I want to deal with my addiction. They should be able to pick up the phone and say, I need a detox bed and find one. But it can take two weeks. Anthony, since you're speaking about picking up the phone, I just want to say that if somebody would like to call in, we have a number you can call. And um, that will be up on the screen, 415-871-2474. Uh, and um, we're going to take a little break and come back and talk some more. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi, and you can catch me on Mondays at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii. Stacy to the rescue. See you then. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with Think Tech Hawaii, and I'd like to ask you to come watch my show, The Economy in You, each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D A N E L I A. And I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Welcome. We are co-hosts of a show called Keys to Success, which is live on the Think Tech Live Network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Okay, we're back. Uh, Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas. With me here today is Anthony Alto, who is uh, with the um, amazing documentary, No Room in Paradise. And the 90 minute documentary um, is now reverberating throughout the community. I mean, you've said that you, you probably can't go in, out anywhere now without people. Well, I don't know about that. Um, typically when I open my mouth and they hear this, this silly Brit accent, um, they, then they, they click on, oh, you're the guy. Um, but I just want to very quickly go back to those numbers because they're, the numbers are important. Well, Alan Johnson, who's the executive director of Hinamaka, which is our largest uh, um, drug rehab um, agency in the state, said is, if we change how we deal with this problem of drug addiction, we can save $2 billion over five years. So w what's that got to do with? It's got to do with the fact that we're turning people away who want to help with their addiction because they don't meet medical necessity yet. Which is nuts, because as he says in the film, what we're yeah. telling them is, go away and become sicker. Well, of course, the sicker they are, the more costly they are to, to help. And then we're saying to them, but don't get too sick, because the way that our drug rehab facilities are set up, they don't get reimbursed for anything that's medical. So if you show up with an addiction, but you've also got, say, diabetes or something, they are not allowed to have a nurse or a doctor on staff to treat that. If they did, they no. wouldn't get reimbursed for it. And so they have to turn you away because you know, they can't bring somebody in. They know they've got a medical problem. 
So we're turning those people away, and they're becoming sicker. There's a guy in the film who's lost his leg to diabetes, right? right? And he, he is costing us huge amounts of money. So, I mean, there are many different ways that I could go into, and I'm, I won't give you the, the, whole, the whole shaggy dog story about all of the different elements of where we could be saving money, but we are spending hundreds of millions of dollars of, at, as it is. If we change the way we spent them, we could make a permanent dent in this problem. And that really comes through um, the, from so many people putting it together in it. And, and um, uh, there were other areas that I thought were brilliant, like the um, going out to the harbor in Waianae. And thank you so much for portraying that in, in such a, a Hawaiian-friendly way. Um, uh, They're great people in the boat harbor, although I would say the majority of them have, by their own admission, ice addiction issues. Uh, but they're living with them. I mean, a lot, a lot of them have jobs. They go, in fact, you, you will see uh, building site contractors pulling up in the morning looking for people who, who from the boat harbor because they know that an ice addict, you know, you've got like gas in your system. You're going out there, you're working really hard. I mean, it's, it's ironic. But, and, and they keep their, their area where they're living very neat and clean and tidy. They police themselves so there's not much crime or anything going on there. But, but but having William Isla explain how this basic lifestyle, the living at the beach some period of time was, was you know, just normal um, a couple generations ago. Actually, right. last week, after watching the movie the first time, uh, or, I was speaking to a woman from Hawaii Island who's Hawaiian, and she w was saying, oh, yeah, every, you know, every summer we would move down to, to Kailua, to the beachside, and we just camp and we lived on, on the beach for a few months, and then right. uh, wintertime we would move Mauka. Right. And that, that is a problem in the sense that the feds don't accept what they call tent cities. It's verboten, it's taboo, you're not allowed to talk about them. Uh, their solution is housing first. Get somebody into housing, and then if they've got a problem once they're in housing, we'll, we'll deal with that problem. The problem with that, of course, is we don't have enough housing. Or, or the kind of housing we have isn't appropriate. Well, that's who. Uh, when it, that was so moving to have um, Nancy and Steph? Nancy. Nancy. Nancy, who moved, I mean, she, she was, so Nancy, the first step in putting her life back together was actually becoming homeless because what she found was a community. She was so isolated when she was an abused mother living at home, isolated, alone, nobody to talk to about her problems. She moved into this homeless encampment and suddenly found people who understood where she was coming from, what she was going through. She made friends. Her friends made, her children made friends. So when she moved off the canal, she moved back into an apartment by herself and she suddenly found very yeah. isolated and lonely yeah. um, and uh, started using ice again. You know, and so that then points to uh, the, another problem. I mean, there are two essential pillars to this problem. One is a lack of affordable housing which extends far beyond just the, the people who are homeless. I mean, there are tens of thousands of people oh, in absolutely. this state who are very close to being homeless. Uh, if, you, if you're earning minimum wage, you're being paid $8.50 an hour. And I met a number of people, especially amongst the Micronesians, dishwashers, uh, burger flippers, who are being paid $8.50 an hour. They're making, they work a 40-hour week, they're making $13.50 a month before the FICA taxes are paid, taken out of that. How is anybody supposed to be able to rent a place on that kind of money? It's impossible. One of the things we should be doing immediately, in my humble opinion, or maybe not so humble, my wife would say not so humble, <laughs> we should be raising the minimum wage. It should be $15. This is Hawaii. It's one of the most expensive places in the nation. You cannot live on $8.50. The minimum wage is supposed to rise to $10.10 .10 in 2018. That's nowhere near enough. That's something, in my opinion, all of the progressive uh, all of the, the, the elements of the progressive community ought to be able to unite around today. It's something I think that would be a good way of us all dealing with the angst that we feel about, what's, about who's going to be our next president. Uh, we probably don't want to get into the, the politics of that stuff, but, but you know, the one thing this, this Donald Trump has said is he wants to spend money on infrastructure. Maybe as a, as a, a would-be real estate magnet, maybe he, he could see the benefit of, of building more affordable housing. But even if we built enough affordable housing, we have to find a way of helping the chronically homeless stay in that housing. And that means for the people who are severely mentally ill, having more mental health services. You know, I try not to talk in moral terms about the homeless issue because 
it's not my place to say you're immoral. But I think in that one specific area, when it comes to people who have severe mental health issues, it is a moral issue. I think it is immoral that those people are living on our streets. You know, people, people are often afraid, afraid of people who are mentally ill. They think they're violent. In fact, they're the ones who suffer the violence. And it's just not acceptable. You, you, mental illness is like coming down with a lifetime physical illness. And like, it's not communicable. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's like diabetes. It's not their fault. They shouldn't be living on the streets. We need to be spending more money on the kinds of things that will help them stay on their medication, be able to get a job, live a normal life. I mean, a lot of them could do it if we had the support services. So we need to have case managers to go and see them every day. We need drop-in centers, respite care, and what have you. And if we did policy, that... And the policy of the way who is allowed to give medicine un, uh, under what conditions. I right. had a talk with Maria Grams, who said it so eloquently in, in the film. We wouldn't treat a dog this way. Right. She said, we pick up dogs that we see in this condition on the streets the condition that some of these homeless people are in. We see a dog like that. If we see a, a dog like that in somebody's house, we call up the Humane Society and they will take that dog away and, and give it treatment. But we can't do that with the homeless because of their civil rights. Uh, we are, I understand how we got in this situation. It was only 25 years ago, you still had mentally ill people in Hawaii who were chained to their beds. So they had no civil rights at that point. And we've got the pendulum has gone from one end all the way to the other. And we've got to find a way, a happy medium, so we can deal with that. But so that's the only area where I would, I would inject a moral tone and say we are morally obliged to take care of, of the mentally ill and spend more money. All of that money was cut during the Great Recession. The money has not been put back. There are other areas, such as the drug addicts, for example, we've been talking about. That, OK, I, personally, I think that, that we should show compassion. Addiction is a disease. But if you don't feel that way, if you think, you know, they became addicts. It's on them. The problem is, it isn't just on them. It's on us because they are still costing us money. They're treating the emergency room as their primary care. It's oh, the most expensive way yeah. of using medical care. Yeah. We are spending this money already. It makes so much more sense to spend the money up front, providing the detox and the rehab facilities to get them off their drug addiction, to hold their hand. And I'm afraid it does take some hand holding but to hold their hand while they go out and, and, and do the therapy that they need to do, while they go out and, and get the skills training that they need so they can end up having a job and then giving back to society by paying taxes, by whatever else it is they do. I mean, we have a little clip of another large chunk of the pie that you addressed, and that is the, the aging, the, the aging population and the, the silver tsunami. and. Um, um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the sound on this, but this is Barbara Stanton from AARP. And um, can you tell uh, the this kind of the story that that you felt in making it around the seniors? Well, for a start off, it, we wanted people to understand that it, by 2020, so where are we now? 2016, four years time, a third of our society is going to be over the age of 60. That's why people talk about the silver tsunami. This is coming at us, and when people reach old age, a number of them end up requiring some kind of, of long-term care. Long-term care, on average, costs $135,000 a year. And on average, somebody who needs long-term care needs three years of it. And how much money does the average working class person in Hawaii have saved, put away to deal with that situation? About $3,500. So clearly, there's a mismatch here. And this is going to be hitting us. And what are we going to do about it? And I think that's the point that Barbara was trying to make. And we illustrate it by showing the, 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 the case of Thelma Suzuki, this lovely woman who was living on the beach in Waikiki for two months. She had been in a foster home and had been abused in it. And she said, never, never again. I'm not going back to that. And she was desperately afraid of going into the shelter. She was so sweet. Yep, there she is. Uh, she was desperately afraid. You could see her clutching her, yeah. her bag there, and, and she was really terrified. And she went to IHS. She stayed two nights, and then she left again. And it took a few weeks, but eventually Justin Phillips was able to persuade her to go back to the shelter. And there he is, there he Justin. Is. Yeah. Um, and he was able to persuade her to go back to the shelter. And, uh, you know, uh, we went back to interview her a month later, and she was saying, I'm so happy I came here. Uh, I feel safe here. Um, I'm never going to live anywhere else. And then we interviewed Connie Mitchell, the executive director of IHS, who says, well, I'm really happy that we got her off the streets. She doesn't belong on the streets. But IHS is an emergency shelter. 
we can't have we can't have uh, we can't be the, the 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 final destination for thousands of homeless seniors. We've got to be preparing for this now, and we're not. And so we are going to be, unless we start dealing with that issue now, we're going to be seeing a lot more homeless seniors. So, um, did you, we, we've run into some um, ideas about ways to, to address this. I mean, there was Stanford Carr who suggested that an increase in the... Um, uh, Let me give you a very quick example of what Stanford Carr has to say. He's basically saying that, that an affordable rental uh, costs about 400000 to build, and the average worker making $14.50 an hour, which is the average income of the average renter in Honolulu, can afford to pay about the equivalent rent that would allow you to build a $300,000 unit. So there's a $100,000 a unit gap. And the legislature has said we want to build 22,000 affordable rentals in the next t 10 years. So it's easy to do the, the math. That's $2.2 .2 billion. So what Stanford says is, well, if we really want to spend that $2.2 .2 billion, why don't we float a general obligation bond, 40-year bond, triple tax-free, at today's interest rate. Do you know what the interest, what, what, the, what it would cost to amortize that every year, to pay down that loan, that bond? What? $100 million. How much did the legislature appropriate uh, this yeah, year yeah. for affordable housing? $100 million. We're spending the money already, but that $100 million is getting you maybe 1,000 affordable units. If we, if we had all of that money appropriated in the way that Stanford's talking about, we could build more than double that number of units. So we're spending, again, we're spending the money, we're just not spending it in a very clever way. So we have about a minute left. I'd like to show the, um, the, um, how we can each individually make a difference <laughs> um, in our own hearts and minds, maybe by uh, watching uh, No Room in Paradise, um, ordering it, and maybe inviting friends over to watch it. It can also be live streamed. Yep. By going to the site. No Room in Paradise.com. No Room in Paradise.com and making a simple $15 um, donation to the Institute for Human Services. So that's double gooding it. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, we wanted, the, you know, IHS, they're all angels there. We couldn't have made the film without them, but we saw them interacting with the homeless, and every single one of them is a really incredible human being. So anything we can do to help them, we're happy to do. And so if you, if you give 15 bucks, it's the holiday season, I think a lot of people can afford 15 bucks. You give 15 bucks to IHS, We'll, we'll, right. we'll give you a free gift of the, the film, either a DVD or a video on demand. Thank you, Anthony. My pleasure.